Hello and welcome to MP3. We are now in continuing our series of um, of uh, lectures on series solutions to ordinary differential equations. And uh, today, in, in not today, but in this recording, we'll be looking at Fuchs theorem, which lets us um, decide when an ODE will have a series solution, when will it have one, when will it have two, when will it have none. Okay, so this gives us a good idea of assessing whether we will actually be able to use the method of Frobenius in our series solutions. Now, in the previous uh, rec uh, lecture, we looked at a couple of ODEs and uh, and kind of showed that uh, uh, there are cases when a series solution uh, we don't get enough of solutions. And uh, here we're going to look at details as to what's actually happening. We're going to start with things like um, a few examples, then we look at singularities, and finally Fuchs theorem. And by the way, this is uh, Lazarus Emanuel Fuchs, who uh, has used a lot of complex analysis to understand uh, uh, when we can get series solutions. Now, this is beyond the scope of this uh, lecture, but we'll just look at examples and then a statement of the theorem and how it's applied. So let's, uh, these examples, by the way, are taken from Arkin, Weber, and Harris. This is the seventh edition, chapter seven, uh, section 7.5 and I, I quite recommend this uh, Arfkin's book instead of Riley Hobson and Benz uh, for this particular topic but you will find this discussed in Riley Hobson and Benz in chapter 16. All right so here are our, our four ordinary differential equations which we're going to analyze in this uh, session. So the first one is uh, well they are here we'll have a look at them in turn and what we're going to do is use Frobenius's ansatz. Uh, just to remind you with the Frobenius method, the uh, y of x is expanded as x to the k, where k is some undetermined constant, times a power series expansion with unknown coefficients a n. And uh, I have already explained to you that uh, the Frobenius method requires that a naught, the first coefficient in this expansion, is non-zero. And if you have forgotten why, or if you want to know why, have a look at Riley Hobson and Ben 16.3. All right, or just think about it. I mean, it's kind of fun to play with these things. Why does this uh, addition of x to the k uh, force us to remove one degree of freedom from the series and make it start from n is equal to zero? You know, uh, this is kind of nice to s actually convin convince yourself that this is this should be the case. So let's start with these equations now. In all four ODEs, we are going to substitute y prime and y double prime, the derivatives of this expansion, and they are given here. Uh, so the, the Frobenius method proceeds quite simply. You take the ordinary differential equation, y double prime minus 6 over x squared times y, 0 in this case, and substitute in the expansion for y, and the expansion in this case for y double prime, which is given here. Uh, you put it in there. You collect terms. Here we are. So in this particular case, you know what we uh, what we end and um, the strategy we've, we've had, and I explained this in the last uh, uh, lecture, was to write this as a single sum, where we have all powers of x outside, uh, not outside, not out in the sum, but uh, all powers of x removed from a term in curly braces here, which involves only constants. A n n k and in this case a number six. So this stuff in here is a constant. It's independent of x, and we've got powers of x here. Now for this particular ODE, this is quite this is trivial because both sums, the sum for y double prime and the sum for this term here, they both involve x to the n plus k minus two. So they, you can simply add them up, and you get uh, this this form for the ordinary differential equation. Next, we use the uh, idea that the basis of powers of x, so x to the n, is infinite basis of powers of x, uh, where n goes from 0 to whatever power of x, uh, to infinite powers of x. This forms a linearly independent set of functions in uh, minus infinity to infinity. And therefore, if we've got 0 is equal to some linear combination of these functions for all, and this is valid for all x in this range, then it can only be true if these coefficients, the CNs, are zero for all n. Okay. What that means then is it lets us take this term in the curly braces here and set it equal to zero for all n. And what you get, what you 
should get is a recurrence relation, but here we don't get a recurrence relation. A recurrence relation, to remind you, would relate a n with some other a n plus 1, n plus 2, or something else. In this case, we have just a single a n there and then some constants. So we don't have a recurrence relation. That shouldn't bother us uh, excessively. Let's see how we can take this forward. So we start, as usual, with the smallest value of n. In this case, it's n is equal to 0. How do we know that's the smallest value of n? Because that's the lower limit in these sums. So it's that n is equal to 0 we've taken here. And we put it into that uh, non-recurrence relation. So you put n is equal to 0, so we get an a naught, then a k times k minus 1 minus 6 is equal to 0. Now, we've, we've said already that uh, the first term, a naught, is not 0 by definition. What that means, then, is that this can be 0 only if the stuff in the square brackets is 0. And that means we get the indicial equation for k. Uh, it's generally a quadratic. So k times k minus 1 minus 6 is 0. And this can be solved to give you k is equal to 3 and minus 2. Now, there is no recurrence relation. So once given a naught, we can't find any other coefficient, which means our series terminates at a naught, the first term. That's it. And that means the solutions are of the form x to the k times a naught. There's nothing else in this. And then we put in our two values for k, so we get two solutions, a naught, or some constant times x cubed, and then a naught, or in general, another constant times x to the minus 2. So our series on SARTs has actually given us two solutions, but we don't have a series solution per se. We have these functions of x, single powers of x in there. Let's summarize what we've seen here. Um, for this particular ODE, we had no recurrence relation. And that actually is because the differential equation is homogeneous in x. And this turns out to be generally true. Uh, but it does give us two linearly independent solutions, x cubed and x to the minus 2. Okay, now if you wanted to prove that they were linearly independent, use the Ronsky and, and show that this is the case. Uh, by the way, I just put a note here that this particular differential equation is an Euler equation, so the two solutions could have been obtained using simpler methods, and I, if you've forgotten how to do it, go back to those uh, lectures on, on uh, differential equations. All right, now let's change the, the differential equation. Just to remind you, we worked with... Uh, y double prime minus 6 over x squared y is equal to 0. And now we're going to make a small change. We now have y double prime minus 6 over x cubed is e times y is equal to 0. As before, we stick in our expansions for y and y double prime. So we have 0 is equal to, uh, just put the 0 on the left-hand side, 0 is equal to the expansion for y double prime, which involves x to the n plus k minus 2. And then we have the second term, so we have a minus sum n goes from naught to infinity, 6an, uh, but we have an x to the n plus k minus 3. So we have different powers of x here, and we can't combine these two sums uh, directly. So what we do, is, uh, as we did in the, in the previous uh, lecture on series solutions, we make a change of variables. Uh, I take, I realize that if I, if I can in order, in order to make this power of x look the same as the one here, what I need to do is to make a change of variables. So n minus 1 is equal to n prime, which means n is equal to n prime plus 1. And uh, and the way you get this, by the way, if you, if you use um, n minus 1 is equal to n prime, then n plus k minus 3 becomes n prime plus k minus 2, which is like the first power of x. That's why we've done this. Okay? Uh, so we have uh, this sum gets modified. It becomes the sum over n prime, but n prime now goes from minus 1 to infinity. Why minus 1? Because when n is equal to 0, when you put a 0 over here, we get n prime is equal to minus 1. And when n is infinity, you get n prime is equal to infinity as it should. So the sum now starts from n prime is equal to minus 1. It becomes 6 times a of n prime plus 1. Uh, times x to the n prime plus k minus 2, which is exactly what we needed uh, to match it with the first uh, series. Now we do this, 
the usual trick in n prime is a dummy variable. You can drop the primes. We can just change set n prime goes back to n because it's just a label. And uh, that then makes these this sum look formally uh, similar to this one here. We can now combine them. When we combine them, we have to make both sums go from the largest limits. So here n starts from 0, here n starts from minus 1. So we choose this as the lower limit for both sums. Now when we do that, we have to define a of minus 1 to be 0 so that we don't get an extra term from the first sum. Okay, so here's what we've done then. We've started the sum to go from minus 1 to infinity and uh, in order to ensure that this first term doesn't have a spurious contribution from n is equal to minus 1, we define a of minus 1 to 0. And that's how we get this uh, uh, nice compact form for this uh, series uh, e series expansion of this ODE. Now, as before, uh, these powers of x form a complete basis. Therefore, we must have each of these terms in the curly braces is equal to 0 for all n. So I've said this again. Since these powers of x are linearly independent, therefore, this must be 0 for all n. By the way, this statement here is an important one. It's good to realize that this is why you can do it. Uh, so we have this is uh, 0 for all n, and once again we choose the smallest n to begin our analysis of what this equation is about. n is equal to minus 1 is our smallest n, so we get a of minus 1, which by the way is 0. We've defined it to be 0 by, by construction. Uh, and so this doesn't really matter. We just get a 0 from this first term. And then minus 6 times a naught is equal to 0. And what this ends up with is that a naught is equal to 0. But we have defined our Frobini solutions to have the first term a naught non-zero. So we have a contradiction here, and no series solution is possible. So just by changing that power of x in the ODE, we went from 6 over x squared, which gave us two solutions, as we saw above, to 6 over x cubed. And now we don't have um, any series solution to this ordinary differential equation. OK, so let's take our next two differential equations. And these now involve uh, a second and first derivative of, uh, of y. Otherwise, they are quite similar to what you had above. And uh, they differ only in the, in the power of 1 over x, which is in front of the y prime. So in the first equation, we have uh, y, pri y double prime plus 1 over x, y prime minus b squared over x squared times y is 0. And in the second ordinary differential equation, we have y double prime plus 1 over x squared y prime minus b squared over x squared y is 0. Now, I'd like you to show, and this is an exercise, that you should end up with these expressions for the relations for the coefficients. So in the first uh, case uh, for equation C, we end up with a, n, brackets, all this stuff is equal to 0, and the smallest n is n is equal to 0. And in the second equation, after you've done your index uh, changes, you will end up with a recursive relation. So this one is not recursive, because there's only one uh, value of a n here. There's no other a n plus 1 or n plus 2. But in the second case, we actually have uh, a n and a n plus 1 included in here. So th this, uh, this has the possibility of a recursive relation. Here, the smallest n is n is equal to minus 1. Now, please show this. It, uh, once you've got those, we can start the analysis. So if we take uh, the first of those differential equations, and now we are looking at uh, equation C. This is our relation we start with. To get the indicial equation, we choose the smallest n. That's n is equal to 0. We put n is equal to 0 in there. We get an a naught, a naught. Then we have a k times k minus 1 plus k minus b squared is equal to 0. And since a naught is not equal to 0, we must have the stuff in the square brackets as 0, which is simply a statement that k squared minus b squared is 0, or k is equal to plus or minus b. So we have our indicial equation for k, and we have two solutions. Now, there's so just su let's summarize. 
there is no recur recurrence relation. So exactly like the first differential equation which we looked at in this session, um, we will have two solutions, but we will have there will be no power series. So those two solutions will be x to the b and x to the minus b, both arising from the x to the k term in front of the power series, but there's no power series now, so it's just that power series expansion just gives us a constant. So we have x to the b and x to the minus b as our solutions. Now what about the second case? So case the, the, the fourth of these ODEs e equation d. This has a recurrence relation. We stick n is equal to minus 1 in here. And uh, as usual, uh, if you see any a with a minus subscript, it will be set to 0. So a of minus 1 and a of minus 1 here will be set to 0. So let's see what I've done here. And what we end up with is, is uh, just a naught times k is 0. So let's have a look at this here. If we set a is equal to minus 1, we'll have an a is equal to minus 1 here, a, is a of minus 1 here and here. Those will both be zeros. This one will give us an a naught, and, uh, and n is minus 1, so you'll have an a naught times k, and that will be equal to 0. And that's what our indicial equation is for, this e for that uh, fourth ODE. Now, since a naught is not 0, it forces us to have k is 0. Now, there's only one value of k here, which means we get only one solution. But this is a second-order ODE, so there must be a second solution, but it's not going to be obtained from the Frobenius method. All right, so let's write this down. Uh, let's, let's write down a recurrence relation. So if I set k is equal to 0 in, in uh, this expression here, we can write down a recurrence relation for a. You have a n plus 1 is equal to a n times uh, this stuff here involving b squared and n. Okay, and then we can start developing our relation. So what do we do? We start with a naught, put n is equal to 0. When n is equal to 0, you will have a naught here, b squared minus 0 divided by 1, and that will be equal to a uh, 1, because n is 0, so we get an a 1 here. So a 1 is equal to a naught times b squared. Then put n is equal to 1 in this We'll have an a1 here, b squared minus, this is still 0 because you'll have a 1 minus 1 from here, divided by 2. And that will give you a2. So a2 is equal to a1 times b squared over 2. But a1 itself is equal to a0 b squared. So a2 will be a0 b squared squared divided by 2. And I put it as a factorial. Uh, because if you did carry on, you would see that you were getting a factorial in, through the, in the denominator. That seems to look fine, doesn't it? Uh, let's see. Let's consider the ratio of terms. We're going to look at the ratio of a n plus 1 divided by a n. Now from this uh, series, a n plus 1 divided by a n is simply this stuff over here. And we're interested in the modulus, so I don't care about the sign. So that's equal to the modulus of b squared minus n times n minus 1 divided by n plus 1. Now we ask, what happens as n tends to infinity? As n tends to infinity, any constant that appears will be negligible. So we can neglect the b squared, neglect the, the minus 1, neglect the plus 1 in the de denominator. And we have minus n squared over n modulus, which is n. So as n tends to infinity, this ratio, the nth plus 1 coefficient divided by the nth coefficient, tends to n. And that tends to infinity. So as n gets larger, a n gets larger by approximately n. And the series diverges. If you remember, uh, go back at convergence of series, we really want this ratio to tend to 0. But here it's tending to n, and which n tends to infinity. So we have a solution to this particular uh, differential equation. We have only one solution through the series method, not two. But that one solution diverges. That's no good, is it? But it diverges, I said, unless it terminates. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, suppose that there was a b squared chosen such that for n is equal to some 
maximum n, n max, suppose b squared minus n max times n max minus 1, which is the numerator here. So uh, what I'm saying is for a particular choice of n, this numerator becomes 0. What would it then mean is that once I had defined a n max, and then I wanted to define a n max plus 1, I put n is equal to n max in here in the recursive relation to get a n max plus 1. Well, guess what? The numerator is 0 by definition. So a n max plus 1 will be 0. And in fact, all a n for n greater than or equal to n max will be 0. Oh, I should say for all n greater than n max. Uh, will be 0. Yeah, which means the series terminates at n is equal to n max. And we can then write it, it becomes a polynomial. It's no longer a series, a power series. It becomes a polynomial. And this polynomial will be given by y x to the naught. Why naught? Because this would have been x to the k, but k is 0 in this case. So we have just a 1 there. And then we have a, a series, um, a polynomial with which goes which is of order n max n goes from 0 to n max some coefficients a n times x to the n and these a n's are defined through the recursive relation uh, we've seen a few of them up here here were a few of these a n's given down there explicitly and uh, yeah uh, and we have chosen n max to satisfy, so n max depends on our choice of b, and we've got to solve this equation for b essentially. So b squared minus n max times n max minus 1 is 0. Is zero. And I've said, you know, you, you, this is a nice exercise you can show, and please try it, that allowed b squared for which n max is an integer, because n max has to be an integer here, uh, the allowed b squared are b squared of this particular form where m is an integer. It's kind of nice to show such a thing. So for these very particular values of b, you will get a terminating series. You get a polynomial solution. And, uh, and this is a valid solution to the equation. For any other values of b, the series will not terminate, and it will diverge because the ratio of these coefficients will start to diverge. All right. And even when you get a polynomial solution to this ODE, you will have only one solution. We still have to find the second one. Yeah, so the, the Frobenius method is not giving you a second solution. And you can see now that the Frobenius method, it can work, but it doesn't always work. So why is this the case? So let's summarize. The first ODE we had had two solutions, but no recurrence relation, but that's fine. The second ODE it, it led to a naught to 0, which is a contradiction because the Frobenius method doesn't allow a naught to be 0. So there was no series solution. That's bad. The third ODE had two solutions, like the first, but no recurrence relation. That's fine. The fourth ODE had only one solution uh, for particular choices of b squared. Otherwise, it was divergent. So it was divergent unless it terminated. But there was only one solution in any case. And that was bad. Now, how do we understand that? Yeah, And uh, the analysis here actually takes you into the realm of complex analysis. And uh, this is beyond uh, the scope of this particular uh, uh, lecture. So I'm going to just present the results, and we're going to see how to use them. So the first concept we need is the concept of singular points. Now, we've seen that in the last recording. Um, here we're going to look at it a little more in detail. So consider an ODE, a second order ODE of the form y double prime plus p of x y prime plus q of x y is 0. That's a standard form we will write our ODEs in when we are doing analyses like this. So there's the coefficient of the y double prime is 1. Okay, This is quite important. All right. So now we define x naught uh, to be an ordinary point if px and qx are finite at x0. So if these functions px and qx, q of x, are, are finite at x0, then it's x0 is an ordinary point. Now, if either px uh, is in, it diverges or qx diverges, 
as x tends to x naught, then x naught is a singular point. So a singularity means an infinity somewhere. It could be in either px or qx or in both. All right, so um, x naught would be a singular point if, if we had such a divergence. But then not all infinities are bad. And in the last recording, we even saw that uh, we had an infinity in our ODE, but we were able to get a solution. So we classify these infinities in two ways. Uh, one is a regular singular point. So x naught is a regular singular point. Uh, if x naught is a, sorry, if x naught is a regular singular point, but both x minus x naught times px and x minus x naught squared times qx are finite as x tends to uh, x naught, then you know. So th then this is a regular singular point. What this means, by the way, is that the infinity in P of x is no worse than 1 over x minus x naught. Because then those, those, uh, the infinite term in P of x would cancel with this prefactor. And if the infinity in Q of x is no worse than 1 over x minus x naught squared, then this prefactor of x minus x naught squared would cancel that infinity. So in these cases, this point x naught is called a regular singular point. However, if p of x diverges faster than 1 over x minus x naught and or qx diverges faster than 1 over x minus x naught squared, then these terms x minus x naught times px and or x minus x naught squared times qx will diverge as x tends to x naught. And such x naught are called irregular or essential singular points. These are the bad ones. Uh, regular singular points, as we'll see, are not too bad. And ordinary points are, well, fine. Yeah. So let's have a look at ex examples and see where these uh, singularities arise. Let's take one of our ODEs. We write it in its uh, standard form. It's already in the standard form of y double prime with coefficient 1 plus some function times y prime. Oops minus b squared. So another function times y is 0, so p of x is 1 over x, and q of x is minus b squared over x squared. Now you can see that x naught is a singular point because p and q both diverge as x tends to x naught. They both go to p goes to infinity, q goes to um, minus infinity. Actually, p goes to either infinity or minus infinity, depending on how you approach x. Yeah, but that's a detail. They both diverge as x tends to x naught. Right. So the question then is: Is x is equal to x? No, is x is equal to zero, regular or irregular? Well, we use the definitions. We take x minus x naught, so x minus zero times p, and ask: Does it diverge or is it finite? Well, x minus zero times p is simply one, which is finite for all x. So that's all right. Yeah. And then we have x minus naught. 0 x minus 0 squared times q well that's just minus b squared that's also finite for all x so x minus 0 is a regular singular point good let's take the second of the differential equations let's take another one so y double prime minus 6 over x cubed y 0 now p of x is 0 and q of x is minus 6 over x cubed we can see again that x is equal to 0 is a singular point as x tends to 0, q diverges. But is it uh, regular or irregular? Well, we take x minus 0 squared times q of x and ask what is it? What is this? Well, x squared times q of x is minus 6 over x, and this diverges as x tends to 0. So the, the, the singularity in Q of x is much worse than 1 over x squared. And that's why um, even after multiplying it by x minus 0 squared, we still have a divergence. So x is equal to 0 is an irregular singular point of this ODE. Now, before going any further, I put down uh, a bit of a note here. Singular points can be complex. And uh, what we need to do is then write the ODE as in terms of a complex variable z. So if we had the y double prime minus 6 over x cubed y 0, this would become y double prime 
minus 6 over z cubed y is 0 and y is now a function of z and not x and we would then find all points z naught where these uh, functions p of z and q of z have singularities uh, singularities can also occur as the variable tends to infinity and to find these we essentially have to change variables from um, from z to 1 over z and you'll find more on both these topics in Arfkin, Weber and Harris 7.4 or Riley Hobson and Benz 16.1.1 please have a look there it's uh, it's kind of nice to understand these topics but uh, we won't be using these um, these ideas in this course so now we are in a position to state Fuchs theorem and see what it says about these ODEs here's what it says if we expand about an ordinary or a regular singular point x0 then the method of Frobenius will yield at least one series solution if x0 is an irregular singular point then the method may fail so let's see what it says here uh, if for our for our ODE y double prime minus 6 over x cubed y is 0 this has mm. here x is x0 is 0 is an irregular singular point here they the method may fail and in fact there was no series solution possible uh, our other ODE y double prime plus 1 over x squared y prime minus b squared over x squared y is 0 x0 is um, a singular point um, and once again it was an irregular singular point so here we get a series solution but the series diverges unless we chose B such that the series terminated so the second clause in Fuchs theorem says that here we, we may not get a series in fact we, we get one but it diverges so the method almost fails unless you choose B such that the series terminates to get a polynomial solution all right and for the first two for the other two equations we had either an, uh, x is equal to 0 was um, a regular sing singular point and we were then guaranteed by Fuchs theorem to have at least one solution and actually we had two in both cases so then comes the question is when can we get two solutions so when expanding about an ordinary or regular singular point we have a few cases if the two roots of the indicial equation are equal then only one series solution can be obtained by Frobenius's method so that's the case when we have one solution if the two roots differ by a non-integral value then two solutions can be obtained so that's a good case two solutions where those two roots to the indicial equation differ by a non-integral value and if the two roots differ by an integer then the larger root will yield the solution and the smaller may or may not yield a sol an independent solution this actually depends on uh, so whether you get a second independent solution depends on the series coefficients the a n for some choices of a n we actually get a series solution but for other choices you may not get an independent series solution so if the two roots differ by an integer then the larger root will always give you a solution but the smaller one may not give you an independent solution okay so uh, in the first case when the two roots are the same you get only one solution from this Frobenius's method if the, two roots, if the two roots differ by a non-integer then you have two solutions if the two roots differ by an integer then the larger one gives you one solution and the smaller one may or may not give you a linearly independent solution and we're going to use these ideas now to sort of make a pre-analysis of our uh, Frobenius' solutions to differential equations you don't just go on and plow ahead but when you're faced with a, uh, a differential equation you first find the singular points 
you find the indicial equation and then you apply Fuchs theorem to it and say will I get a solution or not and if you do have an expansion about an ordinary or regular singular point then you can use an analysis of the indicial equations to decide if you will get one solution, two solutions or one or maybe two. Okay, so we'll stop this one here and in the next uh, um, couple of uh, recordings or lectures on these on this topic we're going to look at examples of how we apply these ideas to differential equations of importance. Alright, thanks for watching.